Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to Happy Mother's Day, of course. And uh, if, you're walk- if you're joining us online, I'm glad that you're with us. We are in a series where we're going through uh, relationships. We're calling it Building Relational Bridges, thus the bridge behind us. A visual reminder that bridges are challenging. Bridges are something we need to uh, construct when we're going across uh, a chasm or some, some divide. And sometimes relationships fall into that category where we need to be bridge builders. And it kind of really comes down to a decision for us. Are we going to step into that role and, and, uh, and help build bridges? And, uh, and, and now when we talk about building bridges relationally, you know, kind of making relationships better, certainly we're not talking about making relationships perfect. There, I mean, we just, it's going to be less than perfect. So our goal really is, is making a step forward, doing something today, doing something this week where it's a little better. And some of you have a good relationship, you can make that better. Some of you don't have a good relationship. It's, it's not good. It's bad. And you can certainly make some strides there as well. Now, the truth is, for, for, I would imagine with every relationship, there's kind of like the ideal and then there's the real, right? I mean, there's like this gap. The ideal is kind of what we, in our mind, it reminds me years ago, Sharon and I were going to Jerusalem, we were driving in, I'd already been there a couple of times, and the guy's kind of prepping everybody, because he's saying, hey, listen, I know you've read about Jerusalem in the Bible, and, it's all, and there's kind of like the heavenly Jerusalem, he goes, but then you're going to actually go see like the earthly Jerusalem, that's where pickpocketers are, and, and it's not like maybe what you're thinking, you know. And you kind of have to lower your expectations a little bit. And sometimes we have to do that, you know, in our relationships where, where uh, you know, the, we have the ideal and it's really, you know, we're often, you know, struggling with the real. I wrote down a few, a few uh, uh, contrasts between the ideal and the, and the real. The ideal is, is like we eat dinner together as a family every night and it's just wonderful. It's bliss. The real is often we're eating fast food in the car on the way to like a soccer game, you know. That's the real. The, the, the ideal is, is that we put our kids to bed and we read them a chapter from a book from one of the classics. The real is often, you know, uh, the end of the night watching, you know, My Little Pony or SpongeBob SquarePants or something like that. The ideal is that you and your significant other, you stroll down the beach a few times a week on the boardwalk holding hands, licking a little ice cream cone together that you share, you know. <laughs> the, the real often is, is that you're lucky if you get a text on the way to work, you know, like. <laughs> the ideal is, is that the kids, they grow up, they sprout wings, they fly, they leave the nest. And they soar out in life. The real is they usually come back home, you know. (laughs) So we have to live with that, right? The ideal. Now, the Bible talks about the real. Uh, Oh, I wanted you to to make this practical. I wanted you, at the top of your outline, pull out your outline. I, I just wanted you to be thinking. Now, you don't have to fill this out, but I want you to be thinking of somebody. Somebody who you want this week to have a better relationship with. You know, you, you, you are, you're striving towards that. So it might be your spouse. It might be a kid. It might be a parent. It might be, a, you know, somebody at work. It could be, you know, a brother or sister you haven't talked to in, in years. 
and, and you write their name down. Now, if the person's sitting next to you, you might want to just like do initials or some kind of code or a little arrow and just say, well, it's really for somebody over there, you know, not you. But write that down. Now, the Bible talks about the ideal. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as God and Christ forgave you. So he says, These are, this is the ideal, but a lot of times that's not in our homes, right? In our homes, sometimes we hear, you know, you'll never amount to anything. Maybe you heard that as a kid in your home. Maybe you've said that in anger or frustration. The ideal is, is, you know, we're kind and compassionate, we're forgiving. Sometimes the real is, is I can't stand you anymore. I don't love you anymore. I'm going to get a divorce. And that's often the kinds of stuff we hear, the painful stuff, the hurtful stuff. That's, that's the real. So how do we bridge that gap? How do we go forward? Well, I think the Bible has some good things to talk to us about. Certainly it's good on Mother's Day, but it's really good on, on any day we want to take take a step forward and say, hey, I'm, on my end, I'm going to do something to make this relationship a little better. So let's look at some things. First of all, I think you need to make it your top priority. You need to make it your top priority. Now, sometimes we mess up priority stuff. In fact, I mess up little tests that, you know, sometimes in the popular magazines, it's, they'll have like a priority test and they'll say, well, you and your friend, you're in a rubber raft and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're headed toward a deserted island and the raft has a hole and it's sinking, the life draft is sinking, and you, and you have uh, some signal flares. You have three things, signal flares, some canned food, some canned water. W something has to be tossed out. What do you throw into the water? And I'm always thinking, well, throw my friend, you know. <laughs> I mean, well, it makes sense. Somebody should live, right? Why should we both die? And also, the, they, they, he can probably swim, right? So, so I usually fail that test, obviously. But Jesus was asked a priority test. Somebody came to him and said, hey, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of laws in the, in the Old Testament. And what is the most important laws? I mean, if you were going to, like, just give us the top ones you think are most important. Without missing a beat, Jesus answers that. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replies, he doesn't have to think about it. He's already thought, he knows, he's operating from that. He goes, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. He's got it. Then he goes, and this is the first and greatest of the commandment. And then the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So two, very, very important. He says, these are the things that are most important. Don't miss these things. I think priorities are important when it, and most of these, both of these are relationships, one is your relationship with God, the other is relationship with others. We can often misprioritize relationship priorities. Other things can get in their way. We can start going after money. We can start, our career starts taking off, and we're super excited. We're responsible for all these great things in our, in our vocation, and, 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 and it, gives, it gets us jacked. It gets us jazzed, and, and, and next thing you know, those become the priority in our lives. You know, selfish things and, and things of, that are not relationship. And so we really need to plan the relationship. Say, hey, this is important. So I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to prioritize this so it doesn't slip out of focus. I don't miss it because Jesus says, you don't want to miss that. You don't want to miss that. These love God, love people. Our top uh, values of our church is to love God, love people. Uh, then we pursue excellence and we choose joy. So, and we have that for a reason. The top two things are the things Jesus said, don't miss that. Now, the things that you want to watch out for, at first is that, that uh, you, you kind of think that you're too important, because that, that can happen. It says if you think you're too important to help someone in need, you're only fooling yourself, you're really a nobody. He just says, be careful, you don't think you're too important. I'm, you know, my time is money, my time's so important, and I don't have time, because relationships are costly, they're messy. They're, they, I mean, if you're like on a schedule, they always go over what the allotted amount is, especially if you're in challenging, a challenging place in that relationship. And so, you know, don't, you can't think yourself is too important. You have to say, this is, this relationship is important and I need to make sure and be part of it. Another thing is, is don't think uh, that God is too important. You go, what in the world? God is important. Yeah, he is, but not too important. It says, uh, uh, notice there it says, but those who won't care for their own relatives, she's so talking about your family, especially those living in the same household, have denied what we believe. He's talking about that 
there's a tendency for us to miss out on priorities, to think that we can ignore people as long as we love God. He goes, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. We talk about that in step two. We're going to be doing step two uh, this weekend after the 11 o'clock service. Step two, we talk about, hey, God's wired you a particular way, and, and your design helps you to fulfill your destiny. And part of the when, when we, uh, the, if we want to love God, we want to use the spiritual gifts God's given us to serve others. That's what we talk about. Certainly, it's something that we want to live out. But sometimes people will get involved in a church or a ministry and they find it's pretty cool. They're making a difference in people's lives. They're challenging people. They're seeing people blessed. Maybe they pray for people and God uses them in that. But then they go home and it's just painful and it's hurtful. And it's, they, don't, they feel unsuccessful. And so they start ignoring that. They think, well, I'm just going to ignore my home life because that, that's, you know, that's not working out well for me. But here, you know, God's using me here. And that's what he's saying is be careful. Don't fall into that. That's making God, like, God's so important, I don't have to worry about the people that are close to me. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to uh, sow into that and make sure that that does well. And that would be a mistake. And so we, we don't want to fall into either of those two extremes, right? We want to make sure that we are there for them. Billy Graham, you know, he died last year, lived 99 years, almost 100 years, had influence Share the gospel probably more than anybody in, you know, maybe 2,000 years. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of millions and millions of people met with heads of states over that amount of time and just had so much influence. And yet when he was asked recently, right before he died, they, they, somebody said, do you have any regrets? He goes, yeah, I've got one. Here's what he said. He said, I do have one regret. I regret I wasn't there for my family in their younger years when they were growing up. I feel like I failed them. They wouldn't say this, but I would say this. Ruth was with them there. She did a great job raising them. They're great kids, but I have missed some things in their lives in those younger years that I never can recapture. I can never get those things back. I think somebody like him who has lived, you know, lived 99 years, influenced people for the gospel all over the world, when he says, hey, I have a regret. I wasn't there enough in my home. That's something we can learn from. Now, here's some things that we can do. Number one is as you plan it. I mean, I think if you're busy, and most of us are busy, if you're busy, you got to plan it. Again, relationships. It's easy to let those things slide away. So you plan it. Say, okay, I'm going to be there for my kid's soccer game. I'm going to go on that date night with my spouse. And then you schedule it. This is where it gets, where you actually pull out your phone, open up the calendar app, and then your, phone, your finger's shaking. Oh, no, it's actually happening now. It's, it's going down on paper, you know, I'm on, on, on the LED, you know, or whatever. And then you do it. It's easy to, it's, this, is, this is important, you don't cancel it. It's easy to cancel your kid's project or your kid's game when you have some other thing screaming at work, some crisis, your biggest client, is they want to meet with you. Oh yeah, well, it's just my kid. No, you do it. You got it down. And you do it. So this is, this is what, how we need to really prioritize, okay? Next, you build on the little things. The little things. Now, this actually is good news because our tendency is to think we need to do big things. Things aren't going well with your kids. And you're thinking, now I'm so distant. I'm never around. I don't, can't connect with them. So you get the kids together. We're going to Disney World for a week. We're all, pull out all the stops. You're doing something big, right? You go down, do Disney, come back, you ignore them again. That's not what they needed. You know, or things aren't going well with your spouse. And so you just, you buy, you go into debt, you buy, you know, tickets to Sandals Resort. We're going to Sandals. We can't afford it, but we, we got to go. And then you come back and you ignore, you, you're just too busy. You don't spend time together. You don't do the things you need to. It's the little things. It's really good news because, our tendency is to gravitate towards something big, but all that's needed is something small, but regular, where we're regularly inputting kind words and deeds into somebody's life. It can make a big difference. Love is patient and kind. Love is, is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. How are you doing on this? This is a beautiful 
uh, writing that comes out of one of the New Testament books, one of the best pieces of literature that there is on love. And right in the middle of this chapter on love, he, the, the author, Paul, kind of writes out some specific things that we can do to express love. And he says, hey, you can be, you can be patient. You can be kind. He says, love is not irritable. And it, notice, keeps no record of when it has been wronged. I highlighted a few things. First, patience. I think patience is really important. It's a little thing, but it's sometimes really difficult to wait with somebody when they're waiting. Probably even harder to wait for somebody, right? Where you're waiting for them, waiting for them to to grow, waiting for them to change, waiting for them to make a decision. That can be hard, right? When you're waiting, when is it going to happen? You know, I mean, have you ever waited for somebody like to come to church with you? I mean, maybe you're, you, you drive the same car and one of you gets ready quicker than the other. So, and you're waiting for them? Now, here's what's not waiting for them is when you get in your car, you're revving the engine, honking the horn, doing donuts. <laughs> I'm ready. You're with your kid. You're, they're doing a project and they're not doing it right or they're taking too long. Here, let me just finish it for you. Or finish somebody's sentences. It's hard to wait. But waiting is a sign of love, being patient. Oops, excuse me. And then being kind. I think just, just simple kindness. You're there for them. You're expressing words of kindness. You're, you're recognizing the, the work that, that they're putting into something. I think kindness goes a long way. Where you say, I want to just be kind. You know, sometimes we make big uh, commitments. Oh, I love you so much, but don't touch my ice cream. You know? <laughs> There's only one bowl left. You know, I love you so much, but... Can you not interrupt me right now during my favorite television program with all your problems? It's, it's kindness. Sometimes it's inconvenient, but it certainly is demonstrating love. Keeps no record of wrongs. How do you know if you're keeping a record of wrongs? Well, here's one way. When you're in conflict with somebody, when, when, when you, in your mind, when something downloads all of the things they've been doing wrong, whether you vocalize it or not, that means you're keeping a list. That's what that is. That little list. Yeah, but if you only knew all the things you do wrong. You're talking like that. And I mean, I got the list, man. I got it. You might have the list, but it's not loving. Loving means you shred that list. That list goes bye-bye. And it's a, certainly a loving thing to do. We certainly like it when people do it for us, right? Wow, that's great. You could have come up with a list, but you didn't. So we're kind, we're patient, we're kind, and then we don't keep a list of things that are wrong. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor in Nazi Germany. He was th thrown into the prisons there. He was martyred for his faith. Uh, and he was actually doing counseling, though, uh, through letter writing with different people. One was a young couple that was getting married. Here's what he said from a Nazi prison. He said, my advice to you is this, don't find fault with each other but accept each other as you are and forgive each other every day from the bottom of your hearts. Bottom of your hearts. I like this verse here. It says, your godly lives will speak to them better than any words. You know, he's talking to families here. He's saying, hey, listen, when you're, when, when you're sharing the love of God in your families, words are important because we can't put on a, we, we're good at putting on uh, the, the face, right? The mask, you know, at work and ever We learned that way back in middle school and before. We learned the art of mask wearing. But in your home, it doesn't work because they, they see you. They, uh, warts and all. I mean, they just, they get it. So, so, so it's really important. That's why it's that, you can have the greatest impact in your home. That you, you live it out. It's not just words. It's got to match what you do. That's why for us in our home, especially as the kids were growing up, we just, it was a constant recognition that we're flawed we were always saying we were sorry to each other because you're just going to make mistakes There's, you know and so what do you do in that situation you just go and i just hey i'm sorry i blew it dad blew it i'm so sorry about that will you forgive me would you can we close in prayer can we just pray about that right now because i i mean you know i want you know i, I want to do better it's got a real open and transparent can make a big big difference in your home 
Those are some things to do. Here's some things not to do. When you see the when when you do things, do not let selfishness or pride be your guide. Those can be destructive in your relationship. Selfishness and pride. Instead, be humble and give more honor to others than yourselves. So when we're selfish, when it's when I'm thinking about me, when it's pride, all about how I look and all about me again, that's that's poison to a relationship. That's that des- that destroys it. That's that's like tying on. You're trying to build a bridge and then you're destroying it as quick as you're building it. Again, I'm not talking about perfection. We all struggle with pride. We all struggle with selfishness. But we can do better. We can do better. I know it's Mother's Day, but I wanted to end with this word to dads, uh, at least this point too. It says, and now a word to you fathers, don't make your children angry by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up in the discipline and instruction approved by the Lord. So he says, hey, with fathers, you got to... You, you have a role to play that's, he's specifically kind of like calling us out. Saying, hey, you, you need to make sure and, and, and bring discipline in the right way. You know, a lot of dads, I think, end up on one, one end or the other. They're either Godzilla or they're Santa Claus. They don't know how to do the middle thing. They either bring the wrath. I'll teach you life. You need to know life. I'm going to prepare you for life. And they're three, you know. Uh, or there's Santa Claus, and, and there's this good cop, bad cop thing going on, and there's a lot of dads that are they're, they're playing the good cop, letting somebody else play the bad cop. And the Bible says, no, you need to bring some discipline. How do you do that? Well, how does God bring discipline? He certainly does a good job. He brings discipline to us, but yet he makes us feel valued in the process. He lifts us up. He doesn't shame us. He doesn't try to pull us down. He, he encourages us. And so we feel loved in the process. And certainly you can do that when you're <clears throat> bringing the discipline and the encouragement, the instruction of the Lord. The kids, your kids need to hear it from you. Not just, I'm glad you're doing good things. We talked about that just a few minutes ago. <clears throat> but they also need to hear why. They need to hear, hey, I'm not perfect, but here's what God is doing in my life. And they need to hear your story about what God is doing in your life. And you're, it's really important. It's really important. And you, you can also, when your kids are little, if you don't know the Bible very well, actually, I did it. I, I know the Bible pretty good. And, and, and I, I would buy little books, uh, Bibles, the, uh, age appropriate, because they were great. They had little pictures and everything. And we would just read those together. Great way to talk to your kids about faith and, and bringing them up in the instruction of the Lord. And then when they're older, when they're teens and stuff, if you have them in our, uh, some of the stuff we have going on here at Vineyard, that we do some Bible studies with the, with the, with the young people. And then when you pick them up, if you're still picking them up, <clears throat> you ask them a question. Hey, how, how'd things go? What'd you learn? And they might say, well, you know, we're fine. You know, I mean, a lot of times it's, they're not overly talkative at first. But if you keep at it, they start opening up. And then you find, hey, I'm finding some pathways here. I can, I can grow in this. Number three, never give up. Never give up. That's important because when we're in pain, when it's difficult, we tend to want to give up. But love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. That word endures comes, has this picture associated with it. Back in those days, they, they would take soldiers in a, two soldiers in a foxhole. They would actually tie their legs together. So before the battle began, so that, w- that way in the, in the heat of battle, if, you, if somebody got scared, they wouldn't desert the other one. We are in this together, no matter what. We die together, we survive together. And that's what it means to endure. That's what it means to love, to say we're in this together, no matter what. No, that's what love, that's what God wants us to do, is to have that kind of love for one another, where we're in it with him. But it's hard, right? It's hard because there's a lot of pushback. There's a lot of stuff that says, hey, uh, it's just, it's easier to give up. It's easier to give up. A lot of times we settle. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, to love at all is to be vulnerable. To love anything and your heart will be certainly wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one. Wrap it carefully with hobbies and little luxuries. Lock it 
up safe in the casket of your selfishness. But in that casket, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from dangers of love is hell. So he says, hey, that's, not, that's really not the best option. That's what people choose, though. Hey, I got real hurt. I'm not going to let that ever happen again. And there's, that's a natural tendency, right? Who wants to get hurt again? But we pursue that. We go, I'm not going to settle for never talking to my teenagers. I'm not going to settle for divorce. I'm not going to settle for these things. I want something better than that. And you don't give up. How do you know if you've given up? Well, Jesus says this. He says, he told his disciples a parable to show them they should always pray and never give up. When you've stopped praying, you've given up. So if you're unsure, hey, I don't know. I mean, I'm hanging it. Well, have you, are you still praying about it? Because when you stop praying, you've given up. That's what Jesus says. Now here, when you start praying again, hope is rekindled. Usually when you've stopped praying, it means you have no more hope. You've, that you've given up. No matter what you say, you've given up. But when you start praying, no matter how impossible it seems, no matter how elusive or far out it is, you're, you're taking a step saying, I believe in a God of miracles, that God can do something. He's a God who resurrects people. He's a God who creates the universe. He's the God who is, 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 does remarkable things. And so we continue to pray. All of us are tempted to give up. All of us are. I mean, there's not anybody here, especially when you're in a difficult place. So you go, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to make that phone call. I'm going to go out of my way and reach out to, you know, that person who I'm, I'm far from. You know, I'm going to do something, you know, that it's going to be, you know, on my end. Now, you might say, well, Andy, if I, if I reach out to somebody... Are you sure it's going to work out? Well, no. Right? I can't guarantee that. No way. Because it, it re, there's another person involved. But here's what I can tell you is if you don't reach out, it, you almost but all but guarantee that relationship is toast. It's over. So you do have an important role. And I always like to remind myself when I'm doing things that God tells me to do, I have his favor I'm, I, I know that God's with me in that process. And, uh, and so that gives me a lot of confidence. It certainly does. And let us not get tired of doing what is right. For after a while, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged and give up. Right? He says, and that's a promise. He says, if you keep, keep at it, you keep sowing seed, you keep working at it, see what God does through you. Number four, you let God love you. God certainly does love you. And, uh, and he wants you to experience that. Notice here, this verse here says, how I need your help. And then I love this, especially in my own home. Isn't that, doesn't that ring so true with us? Especially in my own home, where I long to act as I should. And so we need to let God love me. God, help me to learn to love you and and experience that in my relationships. You know, relationships, I think, are a lot like, uh, I think of like a car on a hill that is in neutral. And you get in it, you get married, and you both jump into this car that's already on a hill. You're, you go right into the honeymoon phase. And you just coast down it and go, hey, this is fun. I don't know what everybody's thinking. You know, why are they having so many problems? we're having no problems. Look at how this thing steers and, you know, or you bring the baby home and this is so great, you know, and isn't she so cute? Isn't he so adorable? You know, that new friendship and you're just coasting. But what happens is eventually that hill starts to level out and then it doesn't coast as well anymore. And then all of a sudden you, you somebody needs to get out and push. And so you start to wonder, well, who's going to do the pushing around here? It's your fault anyway, so why don't you get out and push? All right. I don't, why should I have to push? Now, if you have a good relationship, maybe you've decided you're going to rotate. Who's going to be pushing? But every speed bump, every pothole is this huge hassle. It's real difficult 
The engine's not on. You're coasting. You're in neutral. You just and so every time you have to. And then all of a sudden, now some hills come. It was bad enough the potholes and the and the and the speed bumps. Now you actually got these hills, and now you have to get out and you both have to push, or you're not getting up the hill. And you're both pushing and pushing. You finally get over that hill and you realize. You look out and you realize there's more hills. There's a lot of hills. I don't think I have the energy for all of this. I didn't sign up for all of this. I signed up for the coasting part, the fun part. How do you change that scenario in your relationship? You change it by starting the engine. And that's what God does to a relationship. When we're just trying to do it on our own. Now, I talked earlier about Jesus, and he set priorities. He said, remember, he said, love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. And then he said, and then love people, love other people like you would yourself. The problem is, it's so sad, so many people, they give most of their life to the second one without ever addressing the first one. And it doesn't work like that. You've got to get the first one locked into place first. You do first things first. You let God love on you. You let him fill you up. You need to build a bridge, a relational bridge. You don't have the materials unless God first puts those materials in you, which is his love, his kindness, his patience, his ability to, when we recognize he's forgiven us and that I don't have to prove myself and I can just be myself. And he loves me just as I am and he doesn't keep a list of wrongs. And he's going to be there and endure with me to the end. And when we start to recognize that God loves us that way, we can then start to give it to the relationships around us. We love because God first loved us. That's the priority system. Let God love you. And let let that love go down deep. And then you can love others. Live a life filled with the love for others. Following the example of Christ, who loved you and gave himself as a sacrifice to take away your sins. That was God's greatest demonstration of love, is by sending his son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross, saying, I'm do, doing this because I love you. And I, I care about you. You're too important for you to be in this life without God's power, to go into eternity without being at peace with, with God. And that happens through Christ. Our fears for today our worries about tomorrow, and even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away. That's God's promise. He goes, he is, he's the hound of heaven. He's been chasing some of you for so long, and you've been running, and you've only been running from his own power and from his love for you. And when you stop and you recognize that, hey, God is hounding me. He's after me so that I could have the kind of life that he wants me to have. You kind of just, you just decide, I'm done running. In fact, instead of running from God, you start to walk towards him. You take those steps towards him. Now, I'm going to close in prayer, and I'm going to invite you to pray two things with me. Number one is that you would walk towards God. You'd say, you know what? I want, I want to experience the love of Christ. I want to know him in such a way where I, I, I experience that down deep. And then number two is that I want my relationships to be different. I, 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 don't, I can't just do all these hills. It's just not working. I need God's power in my relationships, and I need his love, and I want that to flow through me, okay? Let's bow our heads and pray. Well, Lord, I invite you right now, because, Lord, without you, none of this, we can't do any of this. We know our relationships are far from perfect. We need your help. And so I'm thankful that we serve a living God. I know we read Bible verses that are a couple thousand years old, but you are a living God today. You're active and present with us right now to change the human heart. For, the, for those of us who have been hurt and wounded, and it's, we've got scars all over, and that scar tissue, just, it's, just, it's not porous anymore. It doesn't allow love to seep through very easily, if at all. God can do the miraculous in you. He really can. It it does begin, though, with you taking a step towards him. You say, I'm done running from him. No more of that. I'm going to walk towards you. If you're willing to say that right now, just in your where you're at, I'm just going to ask you to pray. Say, Say this right where you're at. Just whisper. Say, God, 
I, I want to walk towards you. Today is a day where I want to experience your love. Then you say, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins and to forgive me thoroughly. Even if I don't forgive myself, even if I still struggle with shame, you say, God, give me a clean conscience. Make me new. Then would you say, God, give me the power I need in my relationships. Power to, to be patient. Power to be kind. Power to forgive. Power to give somebody a second chance or a third chance or, or beyond. Would you say, God, today help me, give me the courage to make a plan, to schedule it, and to do it. For some of you, that might mean a phone call to somebody, somebody you're estranged with, you haven't called them a long time. You say, well, yeah, but they made their bed, they're sleeping in it. That's not grace. That's not forgiveness. That's out of your own power. Yeah, anybody can do that. That's out of your own power. I'm talking about, God, you give me power today to, go what, to do what's not even human, doesn't even make sense. To bridge a gap. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.